So again, to absolutely everyone that is here, God bless you. Good evening. Second Timothy chapter number three is where we are. Second Timothy chapter number three, journey to a faithful finish. We are on lesson number eight. So I'm looking forward to this particular chapter, the things that it entails, that which it instructs us. Uh, it's been a good study thus far, and I hope and pray that I'm able to communicate it the way uh, that I've been thinking about it and pray it be beneficial to you as much as it has been to me. All right, one quick note that I want to begin with just as a simple reminder to each of us is that we need to remember we have pray and go still marching forward. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So you see it on the screen. Yep. Pray and go. There it is. Uh, we're running every single week throughout the uh, up until the first weekend of June. That is the aim and that is the goal. Uh, we kind of doubled it up these past couple of weekends for the simple fact uh, that our goal was really to get out uh, just before Easter. Uh, but this month, we want to get to a regular schedule. Uh, so we'll have one team each week going out and doing the work of evangelism with our pray and go. I believe this first week, and I left my names in the office, but I think um, Randy and Corey are going out this week. And so next week, um, I have the schedule written down. I apologize for not bringing it in with me and we can work that particular schedule out. But that is the aim of Pray and Go. If we go out into the community, praying for each and every household within our community, and we have one team per week going out and doing the work. Now, there are there is one team that has decided they want to go out twice a month. If you and your partner want to go out more than once, that is on you. But we're asking for a commitment of each team to go out once Per week. Any one. questions before we get started? I got volunteered. I did. I, I did so volunteer. I know Carl had a question. No, you can answer me. My, my, that's my partner. You mentioned me. Okay. You want to go out twice. Okay. <laughs> so we got two teams that want to go out twice a week. <laughs> but remember, we're asking for a commitment of at least once a week. All right. So that is the aim and that is the goal. So I'm looking forward to what God does with this. And I pray that each of us, as we see God working, will be encouraged by doing the work. Amen? Amen. All right, today's lesson. Here we are. Today's lesson is, uh, I am kind of retitling it. Uh, I just didn't really like the title that it has, Signs of the Last Days. So I'm focusing on the proper perspective in perilous times that we'll be looking at today. Okay? Proper perspective in perilous time, taken from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And again, let me remind you, this is going to be part one. The goal is going to be to get through, uh, down through uh, verse 3. So we're going to see that in just a second. Let me open up with a question. Now, I need some feedback. I need y'all to talk to me. All right? Question number one is this. Are you ready for these last days? And this question is coming from verse number one where it says, know this, that hard times will come in the last days. So the question is, are you ready for the last days? Okay, I'll answer that one. Go ahead. 
from my own perspective, I got to be ready because I have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I can do is, you know, ask God to uh, guide me through these times because I don't have no choice but to be ready. That's pretty much the sentiments that um, Randy just had. Do we got a choice? And you're saying the exact same thing. We got to be ready. We have to be ready for what entails in these last days. And the goal that I'm going to try to uh, bring out is that we have the right perspective or the proper perspective in these last days. So as perilous times, difficult times, or hard times come, we as believers need to have the right perspective. Carl. Uh, I mean, going back to your question, uh, these last, these last, uh, yeah, last yeah. 15 years has been preparing me for these last days. <laughs> <laughs> because because I, I read part of the lesson that talks about how we need to be about the rifle man and we need to be about the Jesus Jesus type of show mm -hmm. and how it changed over the years. And I've been around long enough to see it change. And, and, and mm -hmm. I, I realized about 10 years ago, these are the last days. <laughs> <laughs> Byron, you got your hand up. What's happening? Yeah, I would say my answer would be that, uh, yeah, I'm ready. You know, that, um, I mean, if you, if you in the in the family of Christ and God, you know, you're ready. Okay. So that's the requirement. Okay. Okay. Second question. What makes a person ready then for these last days? Y'all say we got to be ready. You say that you are ready. What makes a person ready for these last days? I just told you. What's that? Just being in the just being in the family of God. You ready? That's the perspective I actually want to challenge. Because just being in the family of God is not going to make you ready. Right. Are you, are we ready? Pastor Ed. Yes. I've talked to people oh, that I know are Christians, that I know are strong Christians, and they are really frightened, you know, in the times that we're living in. So, um, you know, we want to be ready, but if in all truth, some of us are not. And that doesn't mean that we don't love God. That doesn't mean that uh, we don't uh, believe his word. It's just that these are times unlike anything we have ever seen. Can you hear Carl? No, not well. I was he, he mention, said, I can't hardly hear it. He said, good stuff. Keep going. You're on the road. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Carl got that very white, subtle voice. He <laughs> haven't learned to speak up. Randy, you, you had uh, something to say. I'm, I mean, when I was growing up, this kind of stuff mm -hmm. happened other parts of the world they actually just put a chain link fence in canada and and locks around yeah. the church in canada for a man who is in compliance with his rules can y'all hear randy in, he was in jail no 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 Carolyn and randy both seem like they're far away right and they and they write they, and they write close they just got them voices <laughs> I think no, it's nothing to do with their voices. Is we can't hear them. I think I think it's the volume. They don't have their phone turned up. <laughs> <laughs> they they actually in the house, and y'all can hear me clearly, correct? Right. Okay. So I, uh, my voice just carries well. <laughs> we need to have those mics. But, but, you're but right they, in front of your uh, you're right in front of your computer also, but they're yeah, not. And, and they're right Mike, here uh, picking them up. I just got that type of voice, I guess. Maybe that's what it is. I bet if I was over there, I, I it'd pick me up. But he, here's the thing, because, yeah, we do have to be ready because we're in them. We see things happening that's taking place. Uh, so we have to be ready. So the, the question ultimately, though, is what makes a person ready is where I'm challenging. And one of the things that uh, I'm not going to cover in the lesson is something that Carl brought up because the lesson seems to emphasize that it uh, the perilous times or the trying of the last days 
Paul is emphasizing the degradation of what's going on in society, the moral failures within society, the backlash, uh, again, like the churches are going to come up against from the world. But here's where I want to push and actually put a slight twist on the lesson. Because is, is that what Paul really is talking about? Is he really talking about what's going on around us or what's within? So regardless of what happens on the outside, we need to make sure what's on the inside is ready for right. these last and difficult days. Somebody has something to say? Yeah, we have to make Me? sure what's going on on the outside don't affect us what's going on on the inside of us. So, yeah. and then there's a way to do that. And then I'm gonna bring it, I'm gonna bring it home in just a minute. But uh, Gwen, you had something, I believe that was you. Yeah, it was me. Okay. I mean, you know, um, I'm not going to withdraw from society because of everything that's going on around me. But, you know, I'm just seeing some strange things that I'm not used to. I guess I come from a generation that life was unlike what it is now. Mm -hmm. And um, um, it, it just boggles my mind that people are so mean and COVID and you name it, it's going on. Right, absolutely. But at the same time, I can draw strength from God's word. But to, in all honesty, honesty you know it's just different it's just different for me right right mm -hmm. so no you're absolutely correct we are not to withdraw from the world we must remember that the bible says that uh we are in the world but we are not of the world right right and even jesus prays uh pray for us in john chapter 17 while we are in the world, so we don't become affected and polluted by the world. And so the idea or the emphasis that I am focusing on is for us, if we would focus inwardly, we would be prepared for whatever comes our way. But the problem is, it is our inward faults and failures, I believe Paul is actually addressing. Here's what I mean. If you think back over our last couple of lessons, lessons six and seven, lesson six was how to be approved by God. And so as you see on the screen, that there's the outline from uh, 2 Timothy chapter two, verses 14 through 19, okay? And so remember, we talked about those four requirements that we must meet in order to sense God's pleasure. Each of those dealt with inward issues and things that we had to deal with and um, make sure that regardless to what was going on externally, we internally, we didn't quarrel, we didn't mishandle God's word, we didn't, uh, we must dodge godless chatters as the lesson taught us. And also it told us that we have to depend on the firm foundation of the word of God. That was lesson six. Lesson seven was that we wanted to be vessels fit for the master's use. Again, Paul is not dealing with society, their moral failures, how they uh, oppose the church or attack the church. Again, everything he said for us to be vessels fit for the master's use, uh, how we can be a person that can be used by God Again, we're what? All things internally. He said we had to live cleansed lives. We had to live balanced lives, forgiving lives, and for us to live humble lives. Now, just because we switch chapters don't mean the context changes, right? Right. Because if we look at the context and how... um. Second Timothy chapter two actually ended. Paul said this, the Lord's servant must not quarrel, be gentle to everyone, able to teach and to be patient, 
He said the Lord's servant needs to be instructing his opponents with gentleness because perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of truth. Then they may come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captives to do his will. And then he says, but know this. Notice, he, he, he didn't switch. He's still talking to the Lord's servant. He's still talking to us within the church. Know this. Hard times, perilous times, difficult times. They are going to come in these last days. So I don't want to switch the subject. It would be so easy to talk about the degradation of our society. So easy to talk about, um, uh, Randy just reminded me about us gathering together to pray for the welfare of our city, for the health of our city. And even we can extend that to the nation because they are lost. Um, all of these things that we will see in here, we can take it and apply those things to them. But I believe Paul is talking about the Lord's servant needs to make sure that he is ready. All right? Any questions? All right, here's our text. I, I want to read it to us before we get started, before I'm going to use the outline, but I'm not going to focus it on society. I'm going to focus in on the Lord's servant. That's you and I. So, go ahead, Carl. You got something before I get started? Go ahead. I'm looking for attributes of the Lord's service in this passage, and I don't see man. Aha! Aha! You will. <laughs> Remember, I'm staying in context. Okay. Just because the chapter changed doesn't mean Paul's context changed. Okay. So notice, he says, Know this, hard times will come in the last day. That's verse one. Verse 2 said, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of who? God. God. Lovers of God. Verse 4. Rather than, rather, rather than lovers of God. Yeah. Now, just, that's why I was trying to see if he's following the law. <laughs> and verse 5, we conclude. Holding to a form of godliness, but denying its power. He said, avoid these people. Now, we already know those who are in society, who are outside of the church, they have zero form of godliness, but it's those within the church that have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. So that's why I'm going to be focusing on, not on society and the ills that we see. <clears throat> I even started to grab a hold of a, uh, a picture to use and, and tell everybody to be sure that they are praying for Pastor Ray while he serves down in Atlanta. Because those, some of those Georgia politicians, they don't change what the resurrection means. They don't change what Easter. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to stay focused. <laughs> but y'all pray for Pastor Ray, because that's, that's a challenge. That's a challenge, right? All right. So this is talking about the believer, and I will show you how. And so point number one of today's lesson is this, right? Um, this lesson, these perilous times, these difficult times, uh, I'm saying that it is dealing with those within the church, the Lord's servant. And if you notice on the screen, it says the church has left the building. And when the church leaves the building and loses its focus, that is when times become hard for those who profess to know Christ as Savior. And one of the reasons is, is they be have a change in their affections. Okay? 
we're going to see how exactly this actually applies to us within the church. When people have a change of affection toward God, toward the things of God, beloved, that is when we enter into these hard times and the Lord's servant can be tossed to and fro. But that's the next, uh, that's, that's something else. All right, so let's look at this. First thing is they have a change of affection. And notice, uh, the lesson talks about that people will be lovers of self. If you read the lesson clearly, it talked about people who are lovers of self are basically self-centered people. And so when you look within the church, if the Lord's servant is not gospel-centered or Christ-centered, or their focus is not on advancing the kingdom of God, but it becomes all about self. It becomes about me establishing my platform. Uh, about our church having a footprint in the world. You have people who have churches where they are, they want, they want to hold, they want to have rather a national ministry, a global ministry, but they don't even have a local presence of ministry because they're focused on themselves instead of God. The Lord's servant needs to make sure that they do not become lovers of self, but isn't that what we see so often within the church? Do any of y'all see any of those things? You see people within the church are more focused on their ministry, their platform. Are you talking about the universal church? Or are you going to be pointing to somebody else in our church? <laughs> I'm going to point at you in a minute. <laughs> because, but that's where the challenge becomes. Yeah, right, right. You know? So we can talk universal, yeah. But then we'll also, after we talk universal, I'm going to bring it back to us. Right? <laughs> so, so since Carl was talking, say for instance, Carl wanted to emphasize, and y'all tell me, is anything wrong with Carl wanting to build his Sunday school class? No. Nothing wrong with that. But what if the purpose of him building his Sunday school class was for that more people can hear him teach? They would see him. They can hear the depth of his uh, learning and experiences if it was all about him. So we're going to get to more of that in a minute. If it became centered upon him and not centered upon Christ, that's where the issue becomes. And the way, one of the ways that you can see that is when a person begins to teach or to talk, if it's all about them, they have become lovers of their own self. And that's where the challenge becomes. Right? If it wouldn't yeah. become go ahead. I just said right, you're right. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right. Also, you have to be careful when your ministry or you, the things that you want to do become uh, humanistic in the sense that you lose the, the idea of discipleship unto Christ and you just want to fulfill human needs. You have become a lover of self. That is the challenge. What is the purpose of this ministry? What is the purpose of this ministry? What's the, what's the mission of this ministry? To advance God's kingdom. To advance God's kingdom. Technically, Tav just gave us a Sunday school answer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I say that because we, we want to be, uh, I, I use this one. We want to be disciples of Christ who show our love of Christ through what? 
do three specific things. Telling people about Jesus Christ, witnessing. Yeah. Telling people about Jesus and witnessing, but through what means? Y'all, this has been here since, since y'all been a part of the church. Y'all want to do it through a full devotion from the heart, right? As disciples, we, we want to through uh, we want to uh, show forth the love of Christ through devotion within our hearts, right? Right. I guess that mission statement never did catch. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, Pastor. Ray. We we want to have a biblical. Or orientation in our sorry, are you looking for worship or are you looking no, for now look for worship with each other? You want me to tell it? Do you want me to say it? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the, <laughs> the purpose of our church is to make Christ known, right? Through uh, his disciples who evidence a full devotion to Christ in their hearts a biblical orientation to relationships and wise management of their stewarded resources. See, I'd have been up here doing this. I'd have been like, what's wrong with him? <laughs> <laughs> right. And remember we said that that is what the mission is and the way that we are going to do it is by becoming a 3D church, which means See, we ain't gonna give you what we didn't give Pastor Ray. <laughs> I'll just say it: the drawing, developing, and deploying. Yes, through drawing, developing, and deploying people for the service of Christ. If we begin to become self-centered, we will lose focus upon that mission, and we can't do that. That that's basically what I'm trying to get to. We must keep the main thing, the main thing. And in keeping the main thing, the main thing, we will not become lovers of self. Secondly, it talks about becoming lovers of money, right? Or in the lesson, it talks about being covetousness, okay? Or materialistic, or we become worried about our external appearance, right? All of us enjoyed the number of people that was in the building, right, on Sunday. How many of y'all enjoyed that? Okay, I got one, I got two. Amen, amen. Y'all enjoy seeing all those people in the building, right? Right. If our focus then began to become, what can we do to keep that number of people, then we lose our focus because we're only thinking about ourselves. We're only thinking about uh, what we can bring in. We become self-centered instead of saying, we want a church filled of disciples. Thank God for the visitors, right? Love having the visitors, but we want to build a church filled with disciples and not just bodies, okay? Times become hard not because of what society does, not because of the lack of morality within our society, but for the Lord's servant. Times get hard because we become lovers of self and because we become materialistic, become lovers of money. We want that form of self-gratification to we, we, we can say, look at what we've done. Instead of focusing and saying, Look at what God is doing. That's what the Lord's servant needs to be focused on. And I think that's what Paul is trying to focus, have us to focus on in this particular lesson, right? So we, we as the church, we don't want to leave the building. We want to stay on task, not get caught up in our own uh, self-gratification, our own self-centeredness, 
where we can tell people, look at the things that we are doing. We must remain focused in saying, look at what God is doing through his servants. All right. We even get a warning. Right. The lesson tells us that there is a warning that uh, Paul gives us in First Timothy. Now, y'all should have this text memorized. What is the warning that we get in First Timothy chapter six, verse number ten? Oh, come on, that should be memorized. Carl, speak up. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. No, you ain't got to look it up. It should be in here. Remember, hide his word where? In our hearts. In so 1 Timothy 6.10 ought to be in our hearts so we don't become lovers of money because that is at the root of evil. This is at the root of, thank you, all <laughs> kinds of evil. That was 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 said. It is the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. And that's our warning. Our affections change when we become self-centered or lovers of money, I mean, uh, lovers of self, our affections for the things of God change when we become lovers of money. And that is the warning that we are getting here. This has nothing to do with society. They already love money. They already love themselves. But the focus is on the Lord's servant, and that's you and I. We need to make sure our affections Stay, as Colossians chapter 3 says, fixed on things above. Almost asked y'all what it said, but y'all ain't been trekking with me, so I didn't do that. <laughs> Any questions thus far about this particular about this particular point before we go to the next point? Okay. All right. So the Lord's servant. I'm making the claim that the Lord's servant need to make sure that they don't have a change of affection, okay? And I'm also making the claim that the Lord's servant must be sure that they do not have a change of attitude. Now, I know this is dangerous, but I'm going to try it anyway. <laughs> Philippians chapter number two, verse number five. Rejoice? No. <laughs> it's not rejoice. But think about it. The title says a change in attitude. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. What is does that, it say? Is that uh, I can do all things? It's not I can do all things. It talks about no. having this attitude. That this. There you go, Pastor Ray. Let this mind dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Be in you. What you Be in you. Right. you. Right. 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 And there's one translation that talks about the attitude that is within you. Be that of the attitude that is within Christ. Okay. The challenges for the Lord's, Lord's servant in these last days, when times get hard, they need to make sure that their attitude doesn't change. Okay. So what does our lesson tell us? First, you notice a change in the attitude when you become boastful and the Lord's servant cannot become boastful, right? Notice with all of these, you see a issue where within the servant. There's an issue. If you love self or self-centered, there's an issue if you are... Uh, have this love of money. There's an issue where? In the heart. Thank you. There's an issue in the heart. I just knew the nurse was going to get that. <laughs> I mean, it's the left side of the body, right? <laughs> <laughs> but there's an issue within the attitude when the, in the heart of the Lord's servant, and you notice that when they have a change in their attitude and they become boastful, right? One of the ways um, that I thought about describing this uh, it's not in the lesson, but the person who becomes boastful or a boaster is a person who becomes braggadocious, right? So if I go and get my master's and my doctors and I demand that you call me 
doctor, what am I really doing? Exalting yourself. I'm exalting myself. Randy on the down low said, I know a lot of pre uh, preachers like that. <laughs> right? And there's an issue. Right? There is an issue within the heart. We are not as believers ought to become braggadocious because a level of education that we meet or a status um, within our finances because we have the uh, two-story house, we have the white picket fence, we have the two-car garage does not mean that we ought to be bragging. And we do it under this guise. Look what the Lord has done for me. Right? And if you just have faith, that's the prosperity gospel. If you just have faith, God will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Ain't that what they say? Those who are boasters become braggadocious and are showing their self-love. They have an issue within the heart. And the Lord's servant ought not to be that way. Did you have something? No. Oh, okay, no, okay. And so we have to guard that within us. No matter what accomplishes we make, we make them by the grace of God and the grace of God alone. No matter the assets we accumulate, right, is the grace of God that we have what we have. It is the grace of God that we are who we are, right? Amen. Impossible. Go ahead. I just said amen. Okay, amen, okay, all right. And so we have to remember that. Also, there's a very good point within our lesson in that first paragraph where it says that those who are boasters, they are always the heroes of their own stories, mm -hmm. right? Look at me. Our, our, my, 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 my lifestyle is the example, and what should be our example? Christ. Christ. Christ in everything. Christ is our example. And the way for the Lord's servant not to become boastful is always to center everything that we do, center it on the person of Christ and not ourselves. I just wanted to say a comment that made me think about, uh, my daughter has sent out a video of pictures of her husband and saying how much a good father he was. Uh, she sent it to her mother-in-law also. But what uh, really was a, a blessing to be is uh, when um, she said, only by the grace and mercy of God, like he's what he is, you know. So it it's like, yeah, so it was such a blessing to hear her say that. It just made me, encourage me also, you know, always give God the glory, always, because he's the one who makes us who we are. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. as, as a matter of fact, Sister Sherry, uh, my life verse, if you will, is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 31. And it says, in everything that you do, do it to the glory of God. Okay? Um, every, uh, I tried to every email that I send, uh, if you notice at the end of our um, emails that we send, I, I send out for um, the Zoom links. After you see my name, you see the initials S-D-G. Oh, yeah. Exactly. It, it, it stands for Soli Deo Gloria. And I'm trying to say in everything that I do to the glory of God alone. And I, and I try to do that because I want my attitude never to become boastful. I never want to become proud. And that's the second point of the change of attitude. You see, the big person becoming proud. And in these last days, this is what you're going to see. Because these people are in sin, and remember 2 Timothy chapter 2, those latter verses, they are in the snares of Satan doing his will. They are automatically proud. For us, 
It is us who are not to be of a proud heart. Okay? And I like how the lesson talked about those who are proud, look at what they do. They put themselves above other people. That just means they ain't read James chapter 2, right? They put themselves above other people, right? When they see one person come in, if they don't fit the bill, they, you sit that person in the back. But the moment of someone of status, right, comes in, you bring them up to the front. We must be, the Lord's servant must be like the Lord himself, who has no respect of person. We should never place ourselves above another, right? And again, that's Philippians 2, that's Galatians chapter 6, okay? Also, being proud shows forth your arrogance, your haughtiness, as old school King James Version, Version would say. This is what this means. And wh why would Paul be focusing on those outside of the church? No, he's saying that the Lord's servant needs to be careful because this is what we are going to see inside the church. Those who boast of themselves instead of boasting of Christ and those who are proud, who are arrogant within the church. That's where the problem is. And that's what we need to set our focus upon. All right, let me, any questions? Any statements about those things? All right, so there's a warning our lesson talked about. I know y'all read Deuteronomy chapter eight when y'all saw this because you wanted to be familiar. I know y'all did, right? Y'all took the lesson home on Sunday. Y'all read through the entire lesson. You saw Deuteronomy chapter eight and you read the whole chapter. And so you know the context. You know, it's Moses telling them that when you get over there, uh, houses you didn't build, uh, 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 rivers flowing with milk and honey, all, all these good things coming out of Deuteronomy chapter 8. And what does God warn the people about? What does he warn them about? Don't forget the Lord thy God and go after other gods or think that you've done it yourself. Don't forget the Lord thy God. Don't think you've done this yourself. Don't think the victories that you have experienced, you did them. No, it was the Lord your God. This is why I'm saying Paul is not talking about society. He's talking about within the church. If we become braggadocious and said, man, we, we did good. We had a good crowd here on Sunday. Yeah, just watch five of us be here on this coming Sunday. No, the Lord did that. We give him the glory. All that we do, we go out and do pray and go, and we see people come to faith in Christ. It wasn't us. It was Christ. Amen. It was the Spirit of God working in those people's heart. Do not forget the Lord. He's talking to us, church. That is the warning. Any questions? All right, let me get to this practical wisdom that we come to um, because he tells us about uh, becoming proud and the wisdom that we get from, is that what I did? The wisdom that we get from Proverbs chapter 16. So notice what it says, okay? Notice the warning that God gives us in Proverbs chapter number 16, verse 5. It says that the Lord loves proud people, right? Nope. Oh, come God on now. Everybody. <laughs> so what what does the scripture say? Hate the proud. Give grace to those who Yeah, but what what does he say in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5? It's on the screen. <laughs> I ain't asked you to memorize this one, it's on the screen. Somebody talk to me and tell me what it said. The Lord detects the proud. He detests them. They will surely be punished. Possibly to be punished? They will surely be. May be punished. No, surely be punished. Surely. He's talking to us, church. He is saying he detests those who are proud, and he will punish those who are proud. 
So the Lord's servant needs to be careful. There's more wisdom from the Proverbs that I wanted to bring out here. And so I'll just uh, show you this real quick. Proverbs chapter 6. 16, the Lord hates. He detests those haughty, proud again. Those who are haughty or proud. You also see the lying tongue and heads that kill the innocent. But the emphasis is that the Lord hates those who have the haughty eyes. Here's another piece of wisdom from the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. Verse 12 says, wisdom, it says, I, wisdom, live together with good judgment. I know where to discover knowledge and discernment. That's where the Lord's servant should be, right? Verse 13, all who fear the Lord will hate evil. You have the same mindset that God has toward these things, and you should hate evil. Therefore, the, the writer of Proverbs says, I hate pride and arrogance. That should be our attitude toward boasting and being proud. Our attitude toward it ought to be that we hate that type of mentality. But the problem becomes within the church, we become boastful and proud, and we don't hate the thing that God hates. We embrace it. That's when the church leaves the building. So really quick, because we are out of time. Change the attitude, both in boasting, secondly, being proud, and thirdly, uh, the lesson talks about blaspheming. And so I'll just run through this real quick. What does blaspheming or demeaning of people, what is it talking about? Talking about those who have an attitude and they scoff at the things of God, okay? They rail against those particular types of things. So when you and I come talking about evangelism, discipleship, and focusing on those particular types of things, and say, no, the church needs to be about all of these other things. When you lose focus, the Lord's servant, you become out of position for the blessings of God. I think that's what Paul is trying to get us to see. Paul wants us to say, see that he's not talking about those in society, but he's talking about us. We, because of our egos, our, our, our overinflated egos, we become scoffers at God or even blasphemers within the church. And so the warning is for us to make sure that we are not that way. One of the ways that we do it, we forget that one another, we are created in the Imago Dei or the image of God. And we will slander one another. Again, that is something the Lord hates. And our hearts are in the wrong place. Let me just go ahead and throw this up there. I have more to say, but I won't say it today. Okay. How does Jesus describe those with this type of heart? In Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Let me read it to you real quick and we done. He calls them broods of vipers and says, how can you speak of good things when you are evil? And he was talking about those who had that outward external appearance of being righteous. He said, for the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. The problem is with all of this, there's an issue of the heart. Paul is not telling us to check the issue of those in society. Their heart is already desperately wicked above and beyond that which we can think of. But for us within the church, the challenge become making sure we are not braggadocious, making sure we are not proud and arrogant, and making sure that we are not blaspheming against the things of God under the pretense that we are about the things of God. Any questions? All right, so today we covered a change in our affections. We covered a change in our attitudes. Next week, we'll pick up talking about 
a change within our actions. We need to do a self-examination if we proclaim to be the Lord's servant. And that's just my final thoughts. You can see it on the screen. I won't even talk about it. But that's what I think Paul is envisioning here in this text. Any questions about how I have applied this text versus kind of how the lesson or uh, the way it was initially taken us to focus on the degradation, the moral failures of society, but I'm focusing inwardly within the church because I think that's what God is most concerned about. Judgment starts where? Oh, First. But, uh, God, God, speak up, Carl. Go ahead. I was just saying, I'm glad we ended up with some verses in the lesson. You got to study your Bible when you come to Bible class. That is right. That is right. <laughs> Any question for those of you at home on Zoom? All right. But this is where we are going to pick up next week. All right. All right. Amen.